Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on optimizing health for menopause and thereafter through lifestyle medicine. This is part of the 2024 Lifestyle Medicine webinar series hosted by the Sri Lanka Society of Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, I'm Dr. Raida Wahab Daniel from SLSLM and I will be moderating today's session. I would also like to say thank you for taking time out of your Saturday to join us for today's session. So menopause is a significant phase in, in a woman's life that brings about many physical and emotional changes, and these are often very challenging. And unfortunately, there is usually a lack of reliable, evidence-based information out there. And what is available is usually very confusing or contradictory. So this highlights the importance of today's discussion, not just for women, but for men as well. And uh, it will pro provide a clear evidence-based strategies to navigate this phase of life. So our speaker for today is uh, none other than Dr. Tasha Miranda. Dr. Tasha is a Sri Lankan British trained family GP with extensive experience in menopause care, both in the UK and in Singapore. Uh, she's currently based at Osler Health International in Singapore. And she has a deep expertise in lifestyle medicine, diabetes, gut health, women's health, the list is endless. Uh, Dr. Tasha is a recognized member of the British Menopause Society and is a certified IBLM diplomat. Today, Dr. Tasha will dive into how lifestyle medicine can optimize health during menopause and beyond. She will explore how menopause affects your body, the steps you can take to manage menopause-related challenges, uh, a few biohacking tips uh, to improve your overall well-being, and the role of hormonal replacement therapy in menopause. So just before we begin, a few housekeeping rules. Um, Dr. Tasha will be presenting for about 45 minutes, followed by a 15 to 20 minute Q&A session. Uh, and you'll, be, uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask your questions. So please raise your hand and we'll address them individually. Uh, additionally, you can also add your questions to the chat as well, and we can address them there. Uh -huh. Please be kind enough to keep your microphone on mute uh, during the presentation. And this webinar is also being recorded for those who could not attend today. And we will be sharing it uh, on our SLSLM YouTube channel. Lastly, um, if you have time, it would be really great if you could fill out our questionnaire. This helps us to improve uh, things for you in the future as we hope to continue this webinar series for the latter half of this year with some amazing speakers lined up. So now, uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Tasha. Tasha, over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Raisa. Thank you everyone for being here. I appreciate it's a Saturday post lunch. Uh, I'm hoping that I can give you some real nuggets when it comes to health and well-being. And really, it is about going for gold when it comes to your quality of life. And this is why I'm so glad, Rai, that you mentioned this is not just for the women out there. I really want us doctors and partners, men out there to be here, to listen, to understand, and to be able to help and support. Um, Right. So this is quite a huge subject and I would love to spend hours talking about it. And I know people who know me do know that I can. Um, but what I'd like to do is really be able to condense it and for you to have some key take home messages. Um, one thing I'd like you to do is actually jot down a few things that you think are interesting. And then at the end, make sure you have three take home messages that is personal to you. And this is something you can even put on the feedback form so that for us as part of the uh, Sri Lankan Society of Lifestyle Medicine can see where actually your interests are and where we can then focus further talks on in the future as well. So this is just a little bit about me. Um, I had the pleasure of being back home in Sri Lanka last year to attend the conference for uh, the Lifestyle Society for Lifestyle Medicine and to do the exam in Sri Lanka with a colleague of mine here in Singapore. And it was really nice to connect with, new, with doctors I hadn't met before and with friends and colleagues who I have. So this is why for me, it's, I'm really, really thrilled to be here um, to focus on the Sri Lankan Society of Lifestyle Medicine and how we can really improve health and well-being. Right, so let's start with what is lifestyle medicine. 
it's really important to know that it is a branch of medicine. It is evidence-based. There is no quick fix. There is no magic medicine. Okay, and I'm going to say that early because if you're here thinking I have a quick, um, you know, fact-busting myth, I'm afraid I don't. But it's really looking at how we can optimize our habits that are sustainable in the future. So we're looking at it from a prevention point of view, rather than waiting to have an abnormal blood test or an abnormal scan to then have to do something about it. It's also about reversing disease, which is very, very important. So let's talk about chronic disease in Sri Lanka. This is WHO data from 2020. You can see, you know, 23, 24%, 23%, we're looking at diabetes, cancer risk, heart disease. These are huge, huge chronic conditions that we can either prevent or reduce the risk of. And this is not about medication. This is about looking at things from what you can actually do to improve your quality of life. 80% of chronic disease is lifestyle related. Now, this is UK government uh, from a poll that was done, but you can see 40% of women cited feeling too tired to change their diet or exercise. All studies that we have so far indicate that if you eat well and exercise, you will experience a longer and healthier life. Now that's quite a broad statement. So I want to go into a bit more detail. Living a longer, healthier life is a choice you can make today. So this is where I'm going to bring in a term you may or may not have heard of, which is longevity. So medicine is entering a new frontier, right? Over the last 100, 150 years, things have really changed. I'm going to give you recommendations for books, resources, websites, links, podcasts throughout this talk, because I want you to take ownership, see what interests you, and then start looking into it, reading about it, listening to various podcasts and trying to understand a bit more so that then you can build on the knowledge you already have. At the end of the day, our life is ours. And if we don't take charge and do something about it, I don't think it's fair for anyone else to have to do that for us. So we're going to look into a little bit about what longevity medicine is. So Peter Atia has coined sort of longevity um, really looking at prevention of chronic disease. So there are a few key terms. So biological age versus chronological age. So it's looking at what your age as part of a calendar is versus what do your insides actually say? Are you younger? Are you older? Are you the same? And why does it matter? At the moment, with longevity, it's split into two. So it's health span and lifespan. Health span is the age you are healthy until. Lifespan is the age you die. Unfortunately, the gap between the two is about 10 years. So from our mid 70s to mid 80s, we're not living the healthiest and the best quality of life. I don't think that's acceptable. I'd like to live to whatever age I live till and then I'm done. Um, and that is what we're looking at on how we can reduce that gap when it comes to the difference between health span and lifespan. And there are lots of interventions. At the moment, most of these are quite expensive with all the tests and checks, but that's where lifestyle medicine itself plays a key part because it's not about all the tests and checks. It's what we can do. And exercise is the cheapest longevity treatment we have. So let's talk about medicine 3.0. Where we're sat at is medicine 2.0. We wait for a test to be abnormal. We wait to get sick and then we get medicine thrown at us. I want to move one step further. So a couple of programs, if anyone has access to Netflix, is looking at living to 100. And this really took off in Singapore because Singapore, the sorry if anybody's not seen it, but Singapore is uh, in the last episode as the, as the sixth blue zone. So blue zone is where people live to over 100. And a lot of research has gone into each of these areas. So in California, Loma Linda, Costa Rica, Nicoya, uh, so Sardinia, Ikara, Okinawa, uh, to look at what 
these centurions have done and what they do and how they live their life to see how they are having such a good quality of life. Second is you are what you eat. Nutrition is 80%. And I know that we all love our food, but it's being smart about it and doing what we can do that's sustainable in the long term. This is not about a fat diet. This is about us being smart about it and thinking, right, what can I do that I can do forever? And finally, it's hack your health. So looking at your gut health. I'm a huge advocate of gut health. And when we look after our gut, which is where 70% of the body's function lies, this is where we can really make improvements with the communication between the gut and the brain and also reducing our risk of disease. I specifically put this slide on because it's the power of nine. It's part of the blue zone. So have a look at the website if you get a chance. But I was laughing with a friend because one of the things here is wine at five. So I'm not saying drink a whole bottle of wine at five, but it's how do you find things that are sustainable? So this is just a really nice way of how they've summarized the blue zones on how these communities have found their way of living. So as I said, this is not about living longer. It's about your, about your quality of life. Couple of terms here, because I know I'm trying to make it scientific, but I know we also have uh, quite a few non-doctors and non-clinicians. Hazard ratio. Doctors, clinicians, have a look. This is really important. So this is looking at the relative risk of an event relative to its exposure. So we start at 1.0. So say somebody is diabetic, their hazard ratio would be 1.3. If they have chronic kidney disease, it's higher, 2.5, which means that increased risk of morbidity, mortality, so basically chronic diseases and death. To reduce it, you're looking at lifestyle medicine. If somebody is in the bottom 5 to 10% for their age, their sex, their ethnicity, when it comes to grip strength, muscle mass, and endurance, that hazard ratio goes up to 4.5. So there's no chronic disease that can actually go that high. So if you think if you're that poor on the exercise front, when you do exercise at any point of time, you can really reduce that. And these are things you can just do. You don't need to be spending ridiculous amounts of money on gyms and trainers, et cetera. If it's something you can manage, do, but do it safely. Also a little bit about the time-restricted eating, because I know we'll have questions on that. It's not for everyone, but everyone should aim to have 10 to 12 hours of a fasting period, because that's what the liver needs to detox and to heal. And also, this is the Japanese saying, is eat until you are 80% full. A little bit hard when we're back home and uh, you have to finish what's on your plate and eat more. A woman's life in hormones. Now, I want you to think about these lines as squiggles, right? So it's going up and down, up and down, up and down. So you can see around that sort of 40 to 50 mark, there is a decline, but it's not this steady decline. It's going up and down, up and down. So which is where there'll be some days women feel fine, great. And then within a day or two or even less, that just comes crashing down. So it can change from morning to evening. And this is what I just want to go into when we talk about the menopause side of things. So let's talk menopause. What does menopause mean to you? When I ask this question in an audience, people will shout out, oh, hot flashes, night sweats. Uh, changing weight, oh, I'm gaining weight, there's nothing I can do about it. And there'll always be one or two women who've been through the menopause who say, yes, no more period. Let's look at it from an average age point of view. The global average age is 51. So menopause is when you don't have a natural period for 12 months. But look at the bottom of the screen. Southeast Asian women, the average age is 49. And for South Asian women, so India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, 47. So when we talk about the perimenopause, this is the time before the menopause, that can last technically anywhere between five to 15 years. 
So it's very frustrating when I have women who have struggled for years and have unfortunately been dismissed because they've been in their late thirties and been told, oh, you're far too young to go through the perimenopause. It's about listening to our patients, so for us as doctors, and looking at it in a real 360 holistic way and ruling things out. So it's always important to rule out the organic causes, but also then looking at how we can help and support women. So as I said, anytime between 45 and 55, South Asia is 47. And yes, it is a natural event, but it doesn't mean we have to struggle through it. And that's what I want each and every person to, to take home from today is you see a lot of this where, oh, it's a natural event. Yes, it is. But as women, we're having to function a lot later into life with jobs, with families, with caring. And we need that headspace to be able to do it. So it's not ignoring things and really taking charge and really advocating for yourself as well. So let's look at it from a symptom point of view. Gosh, I mean, the list is endless. We have over 80 symptoms, but we break it down into how it affects your body. So your musculoskeletal, urogenital, brain, skin, heart, and blood vessels. I've highlighted a couple of key areas, especially for South Asian women, because it's usually not as clear cut. It's not about, oh, presenting with the hot, typical hot flushes and night sweats. Sometimes you won't even have that, but it could be as looking at the vaginal symptoms, the incontinence, urinary incontinence, just fatigue and joint aches and pains. You know, I have to say 10 years ago, I was one of the dismissive doctors because I didn't have the information and the knowledge I've had over the last few years. And I, you know, it, it is something that is needs to be taught more at medical school. And that's why now we're coming out with various ways with training, with resources to educate ourselves. You know, I was lucky, it's something I'm interested in. So I went out, I learned more about women's health. And then you keep up with the research, the evidence, but it's looking at it from the future, right? Your heart health, your bone health, diabetes and central obesity. And that's where, when the hormones start to dip, because our estrogen, progesterone and testosterone are created from our cholesterol. So the body starts to deposit more cholesterol and where does it deposit? Bum, thighs, tummy, arms and upper chest, which is quite hard to, hard to get rid of. So a really good book, if anyone's interested, is um, The Definitive Guide to the Perimenopause and Menopause by Dr. Louise Newson, who's a huge advocate for women's health, especially perimenopause and menopause. She's a uh, GP in the UK, and she's been doing some really good work. But also, um, a lot of doctors are not happy with her with the amount of work that's been created as a result of her education, because women are realizing that there's more to their symptoms than depression, for example, and being started on antidepressants. Let's look at this survey. Unfortunately, it's 2016, there's a new one coming, but I just wanted to show you some numbers, right? This is UK data, but 50% of women aged 45 to 65 who experienced menopause had not consulted a healthcare professional. Another bit of data here is more recently, about two years ago, um, we looked at 2,000 women going through a divorce and eight out of 10 of those women attributed partly that the perimenopause and menopause played a, a part in their divorce. Some other numbers, look at this, 22% experienced sleeping problems, 36% it had impacted their social life, 50% reported it impacted their sex life. Please do not be shy to talk about sex, okay? And I know sometimes it is a taboo subject. It's not something you want to talk about. And it's just something that a lot of women and men would dismiss. But it's important to know that this comes as part of your experience and your quality of life. Look at it from a work-life point of view. Even now, 10 to 12% of women in their 40s and 50s leave the workforce because the perimenopausal symptoms affect them so much. And this is where I find it unacceptable because this is when we are really looking at 
getting to high positions in our work, balancing young families. Uh, and when it starts to affect your quality of life that much, something has to give. So it's really finding the right doctor, your right family physician, whether it's a gynecologist, endocrinologist, to be able to sit and have this conversation and to get the help you need. Now, the reason that I've only just put in the six pillars of lifestyle medicine is because I wanted to give you that introduction. So you would have heard me talk about sleep, eating well, physical activity, stress management, the, the importance of the positive social connections and avoiding risky substances. These are the six pillars of lifestyle medicine for us as lifestyle medicine clinicians and physicians. This is what we base our practice on. For me, sleep is number one, okay? Then we move on to the nutrition side of things, looking at activity, exercise, managing stress, the social side of things. And if you smoke, stop smoking. If you drink, moderate it. Look at what you're having. If you're going to have any alcohol, have a good glass of red wine, right? It's finding what works for you. It's not about being so restrictive where maybe for a few weeks to three months, you really stick by that diet, which is why I don't like the term diet. But then how do you sustain it in the long term? So this is where I want to go into more detail and break down each of these areas. So what's biohacking? I'm not the biggest fan of the term, but it's out there on social media. And it was really a technique made popular by the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss. And it looks at combining technology and lifestyle medicine. So that at a personal level, because we are all individuals, I like to track lots of stuff. I wear various things. I know, you know, how I can get my blood sugar just at a nice level. So this is me overnight. Um, I run this on myself a few times a year. And it just really helps me with certain foods, what works, what spikes my sugar, what makes me feel better, what doesn't. I'm not saying please do not now suddenly go out and go get every single technology out there. It's looking at what works for you and doing one thing at a time. So let's talk sleep. As I said, for me, sleep is the most important because data shows if we don't sleep well, so say the difference between sleeping seven to eight hours and adults, we should be sleeping anywhere between seven to nine hours every night. Easier said than done. I appreciate that. But the difference between sleeping that versus four to five is the following day, without even realizing it, you are going to consume 300 more calories. You're going to feel pretty tired and grumpy. So the chance of you exercising is lower, which means then you're not going to be physically tired enough come that evening, which means your sleep's going to be affected again. So these are a few things to really look at. So morning blue light, so important. You know, when you get up, if you have access to a little balcony, garden space, when you're having that morning water, tea, coffee, get a few minutes of sunlight. It then wakes up the system. It restarts your circadian rhythm. So the body knows, right, they're up now. And then 12 hours later, the body starts to prepare to go back to sleep. Limiting caffeine and alcohol, especially when it comes to caffeine, it's looking at trying to finish having any caffeine by 12 noon, two o'clock at the latest. Because caffeine can stay in the system, depending on you as an individual, your gut health, your general health and well-being, can stay in the system for a good 10 to 12 hours. So it's finding what works for you. There are so many options for sleep trackers as well. So this is something that you can consider, but I wouldn't put it on the priority list because you've also got to take cost, the cost factor into account. Jet lag, going west, going east, gosh, that's an entire different talk that I can give on how to manage that. But it's trying to find your rhythm as early as possible and using that morning blue light to get your body set up. The most important thing here is your sleep hygiene and routine. And this is not a Monday to Thursday, Monday to Friday thing. You need to do it all the time. So it's that regular sleep schedule, having a regular bedtime routine, seven days a week. Remember, the bedroom is for sleep and sex. So avoid any technology in the room. Um, especially, you know, a lot of people like to watch some TV or something on the iPad before sleeping. But that actually can get... Uh, you keep you awake for longer, but try different things. You're not going to do all of this all at the same time. So this is why I wanted you to write down those three key points and three key take-home messages. 
so you can work on one thing at a time. Eating well, my favorite. Okay. So um, Dr. Linia Patel is a uh, in the UK and she's just written a book called Food for Menopause. And I've been doing some work with her. The book's out in the UK in September. And I've had the pleasure of actually uh, getting a copy to read ahead. And it's just really nicely laid out because it's, again, what's sustainable. It's about eating right and eating well. Please don't be restrictive. Everyone thinks we have to be on this massive calorie deficit to lose weight. That's not the case. A lot of the times when you're in too much of a deficit, you end up retaining a lot more fluid, depositing a lot more fat, and it gets very, very frustrating. Two key take-home messages from eating well, protein and fiber. Protein is so important. The recommended daily allowance is nonsense. 0 0.8 grams per kilo of body weight is, yeah, it's nothing, right? Really aim for anywhere between 1.6 to 2.2 grams. So you're looking at about 30 grams of protein per meal. And then if you're looking at a snack, sort of 10 to 20 grams. So you're going into a meal, not because you're hungry, but it's because you're mealtime. So if you're feeding and fueling your body correctly for yourself, you go into your next meal because it's, oh, it's lunchtime. Let me have lunch. Not, oh my goodness, I'm starving and I can't wait to, to have food. Fiber comes as part of your complex carbs. So don't worry about carbohydrates, please. It's really important that you get the complex carbohydrates in. And with your fiber, you're looking at an average of 30 grams per day. I put a little bit of information about sort of phytoestrogens, how to get that nutritionally. And this is through your soys, edamames, flax seeds, then progesterone and testosterone. You can't get directly through food, but through some foods, it can just activate the body's system as well. And I mentioned earlier about time-restricted eating. More than anything, it can get a lot harder for women as we get older and go through the perimenopause to do the long intermittent fast, so time-restricted eating. So if it's getting harder, just go down a bit. If you're doing a 16-8, go down to a 14-8, go down to a 12-12. As I said, the liver needs about 10 to 12 hours to calm down. Everything else is more on what you enjoy doing, right? And what works for your routine. And it really helps with your gut health as well. Oh, physical activity. Ladies, 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 you have to lift some heavy weights. You are not going to look like a bodybuilder. It takes a lot of hard work to look like and a lot of um, many, many years. OK, so don't be afraid of lifting some heavy weights. Yoga, Pilates, all of that falls under resistance and flexibility. You can start with some body weight exercises, but it's about starting to lift some heavy weights. So you're looking at it from being able to squat your body weight, to lift, to deadlift your body weight, because this is how you build muscle. From about the age of 40, we start to lose approximately a percent of muscle mass every year. And that's huge. So we need to be able to maintain it because when we start to lose muscle mass, we start to deposit fat as well. There's also a lot of talk about HIIT workouts and heavy, high intensity exercise. It's got its place, but you're really looking at that zone to fat burn. Now, numbers wise, you're looking at 60 to 70 percent of your maximum heart rate. But it's as simple as walk at a pace where you can talk, but you can't sing. So go for a walk and talk, right? You don't have to always go and sit and have coffee and brunch, or you can do your walk and talk first and then go eat. So it's just finding ways to build it into your day-to-day -day activity. Ladies, did you also know that you could use your menstrual cycle to actually create an exercise program? So Mindy Peltz has written a couple of books and one is looking at fasting, right? And it's looking at your period as well and how you can really optimize exercise during your cycle. So day, day one is when you start your bleed. So that first two weeks is when your body is starting to build more estrogen, testosterone. So you can lift heavy weights. You, you are strong. You can hit, hit those personal bests. Afterwards, coming towards the latter stage of your cycle, when the progesterone starts to come up, that's your calming hormone. But that's also when the mood changes can happen. So your premenstrual symptoms, PMS, your PMS, PMDD. This is where you do more of the resilience work, the resistance work, your yoga, your pilates, more of the zone two. 
So it's a good book if anyone's interested um, to, to read and look at. Stress management, gosh, so much here. We tend to just assume that our lives are stressful and we just have to deal with it and manage, manage it, which is not fair. Stress is not always a bad thing, right? You stress is good stress. So I've got a bit of you stress because I'm talking, uh, doing this, uh, this live talk, but it's a good thing, right? I'd be, I'd be quite worried if somebody told me, oh, I never get stressed. You know, I'd be looking at a, a mental health diagnosis there, but it's finding what works for you and using it at the right time. Distress, when it's there all the time, which is a bad stress, that's when it becomes uh, inflammatory in the body. And actually, the, there is a huge relationship between emotional and physical health. So looking at it even from a depression, diabetes, and heart disease, and the risk of heart disease in depression is similar to smoking. If anyone's interested in mindfulness-based stress reduction and doctors, clinicians, this is something you can use for your patients as well is there are over 800 programs online and a lot of them are, are free. So it's something that you can look at and recommend to, to your patients. CBT, so this is something that, you know, through psychologists who are trained in CBT, it's something that can help. And more than anything, it's about the ability to cope with stress. This is not rocket science, you know this. If you smoke, stop smoking. Cut back on alcohol. When it comes to drugs, just don't do it. Um, if we look at it from a numbers point of view with smoking, your life expectancy is 10 years shorter. And also symptoms of the menopause, including your vasomotor symptoms and sleep are much higher. And it's also the risk from cancers, cardiovascular and breathing difficulties. Positive social connections. Find ways to incorporate this. This includes in your workspace, say you are at work in a corporate environment, you're in an office. Do you have to have a sit down meeting all the time? Can it be a healthy eating event? Can you do some group exercises? Look at that work-life connection and balance. Do the walk and talk. So I've coined it an Osler walk and talk. So we get together, whoever's available as a team, uh, and we try as often as we can to to go and have a walk and a talk, and then we finish off with, with breakfast or brunch. So it's just a nice way to connect rather than just being sedentary and sat down, because I think we all do that far too much. Right, back to the menopause and treatments. As I said, a lot of information, but, um, and I'm sure you have lots of questions as well. Treatment. I'm gonna start with hormone replacement therapy, but for me, the reason I went into the lifestyle piece first is I look at this as a pyramid. Your foundation needs to be those solid six pillars of lifestyle medicine. If we can really implement that, then any treatments are top-ups, they're sprinkles. Because if you don't have that foundation in place, you'll end up needing more and more treatment with none of the benefit that you could get if you had solidified that foundation. But hormone therapy plays a huge part. Now, unfortunately, I did a little bit of uh, research uh, about availability in Sri Lanka. And I know that we've got access to Femiston, but which is um, uh, combined oral hormone therapy. But there's still quite a taboo. Um, I was also looking at anyone who prescribes it. I came across one clinic in Ragama. But it's also looking at how do we give women the best quality of life and choice. This is not about everyone going on hormone therapy. It is about information and about choice and doing things as safely as possible. All it is, is giving back hormones. Now, I know we call it hormone replacement therapy, but we're not replacing anything. All we're doing is just giving back what that woman is lacking. Estrogen, progesterone, and never forgetting testosterone. You may have seen a lot in the news recently about testosterone. In the UK, in the US, in Europe, it's really taken off where women are taking charge of their health and well-being. There are different types available, combinations, routes, which I'll go into. It is the most effective treatment for severe symptoms. We don't just start anyone on hormone therapy. This is not at the moment. We don't have the evidence to show that everyone should just be started on it. Might come a time. There's a lot of evidence, especially with hormone therapy coming up as a longevity treatment. But at the moment, it's looking at the symptoms, the relief of symptoms, 
treatment of osteoporosis, which is breakdown of the bones, and also to protect the heart. Menopause symptom questionnaire. I would like anyone, if this um, uh, applies to you, you can go on to a website called Balance Menopause. Uh, it's an app as well. It's all free, done by uh, Dr. Louise Newson and her team. And fill out a menopause symptom questionnaire and look at it from a scoring point of view. Now, I'm not saying all the scoring would be as a result of the perimenopause or menopause, but it's looking at where your baseline is and looking at the score. So you know what your score is. So anyone who scores about 15, 1, 5, the recommendation is you can consider some hormone therapy. We have over 80 odd symptoms, as I mentioned earlier. These are the key symptoms. Okay. Now, options with hormone therapy. So it's estrogen. I'm just going to focus here on estrogen and progesterone. Um, testosterone comes in the form of a gel, and that is usually secondary. And we add that. It's technically only licensed for a very, very low sex drive, something called HSDD. But it's there and it's there as an adult, or we can use it all at the same time. Now, safety-wise, you may have heard about a study done 20, 21, 22 years ago, um, where unfortunately the data was, in a sense, misinterpreted, misrepresented, but a lot of that evidence were in was in actually older women. And where what we had hormone therapy-wise were oral and synthetic hormones, whereas what we have now, especially what I've highlighted, the transdermal estrogen, so E is estrogen, so that's through the skin, either as a gel or a patch. Oral progesterone, which is body identical. So these are as close to the body's hormones as they come. It's called eutrogestin. And the marina coil. I'm a big fan of the marina coil because it works both as contraception and as the progesterone component when it comes to hormone therapy. And it sits in the womb. And it's out of sight, out of mind. So all you need then on top of that is a little bit of estrogen. Not forgetting vaginal estrogen, which is very localized. It can be given to anyone, whether they have a history of cancer or not. So that's very important to know. But just to help with those genitourinary symptoms, because a lack of estrogen especially is thinning of the hair, the nail, the skin. So I know we had a question about hair thinning and how we can optimize that. Always we go lifestyle measures, nutrition, getting that muscle mass in, getting uh, the strength in. And then we can always, depending on the symptoms, look at it from a hormone therapy point of view. This is uh, the position statement from the North American Menopause Society, which came out a couple of years ago. And it's just important to know because first thing, most women, even now, I have to say it's gotten a lot better in the last couple of years, but even now, everyone goes, oh my goodness, but I'm going to get breast cancer. If used correctly, and with what we have available now, the benefit far outweighs the risk. And that's important to know. It's also important to start as early as possible. So in that perimenopause stage, rather than postmenopause, but it comes down to access, knowledge, information, and finding the right clinician to have the conversation with. And even now, that is difficult. So breast cancer. Uh, I put a couple of links in there and I'm sure we can share all of this later as well. But I just really want you to focus, I'm not sure if you can see the pointer, but focus on this. We all look at hormone therapy and the risk of cancer and breast cancer, but being overweight or obese, the risk of cancers are far, far higher. So again, going back to that lifestyle medicine piece, which is optimizing your nutrition, your exercise, the weight management side of things, to be able to reduce your risk of cancer. Breast cancer and hormone therapy. Breast cancer is the most common cancer in women in the UK. And when used in the first five years, generally speaking, especially through the skin uh, or as body identical, the risk is minimal. And even then, after that, it's less than one in a thousand, okay? Looking at it from a progesterone point of view, if you drink, and let's say total hormone therapy, if you are overweight or drink two glasses of wine alcohol a day, your risk of breast cancer is much higher than being on hormone therapy. And for me, that is significant. Okay. Estrogen only hormone therapy. So this is there for women who have had to have a hysterectomy. So that's where the womb is removed. 
if the ovaries are kept in, sometimes the ovaries can work a little bit longer to sustain the body's hormones. But it doesn't last as long as if your if your um, womb was in place or if the ovaries are taken out at the same time, you go into an immediate menopause. And I know we had a question about that as well. But the, if that is something that has to happen, then being on uh, estrogen only hormone therapy. Actually, there is no higher risk of breast cancer. And in a sense, we even have data to show that it lowers the risk. With family history, genetic or a personal risk, this is a conversation, right? I don't want you to worry thinking, gosh, my grandmother in her 90s had breast cancer, therefore I shouldn't go on hormone therapy. It's part of the conversation we have. Blood clots. This has almost become uh, not something we discuss too much because most of the hormone therapy we prescribe is transdermal, which is through the skin, especially with the estrogen. So anything like a, a gel patch, there is no increased risk of red, uh, blood clots. I mentioned um, in Sri Lanka, we have access to Femiston. Now, Femiston is a combined oral um, uh, hormone therapy, and there will be a slight increase because it's oral and it has to go through the liver. But it's having that conversation. It's risk versus benefit. If your other risk factors are low, there is no reason why you can't take it and try it. The beauty of hormone therapy is the first three to six months is simply a trial. So if it works for you, fantastic. If it doesn't, you stop. Within a day or two, your hormones go back to where they were. But it's very important to stay on track of your screening. Two key areas, your breast screening and your cervical screening. I recently uh, found out there's no, and please correct me if I'm wrong, there is no term for cervical screening in Sinhalese. Um, but if anyone knows of one that there is, could you please put it on the chat? Um, because that'd be really interesting to know, uh, to be able to, from an education point of view. Right, who shouldn't take HRT? So before we said, if you had a history of breast cancer or wound cancer, that's a definite no. But now it's a specialist decision, right? But it's finding the right multidisciplinary team to work with you to give you the right information and remember the choice is yours this is you this is your body and you make that decision but if you're having undiagnosed vaginal bleeding then you need to investigate the root cause first if you have severe heart disease then that takes priority if you have severe liver disease absolutely and i don't need to say twice pregnancy other treatments as i said this is not just about hormone therapy there are uh, other treatments as well, especially non-hormonal therapy. Uh, but Tibalone uh, is something that is available in Sri Lanka. And this works where it works similar to estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. But sometimes what happens is it can fight for those receptors in the body. So it's only technically licensed for women after the menopause, at least one year after the menopause, and for two years, right? A lot of the time I see doctors putting patients on uh, SSRIs, SNRIs, which are antidepressants. Biosa is a new treatment that has just come out in the UK, um, and but it's specifically to stop the vasomotor symptoms, your hot flashes and night sweats. So it works on the thermal regulation center in the brain. Complementary. Lots of evidence for it. You can look at it from an Ayurveda point of view, from a traditional Chinese medicine point of view, but it's always looking at it from the traditional herbal registration logo. So this is a UK-based logo. Um, there's some evidence for things like black cohosh, isoflavins. The issue we have is we just don't have any evidence or enough evidence from a drug interaction point of view. So it's, again, having that conversation. Things like CBT, mindfulness-based stress reduction, your sleep, yoga, acupuncture, Absolutely. This is looking at it in a real holistic way. So it's finding what works for you. I wanted to put this link in because there'll be lots of uh, lots of people who are in, in, in the workforce, corporate world. I want you to take this to your HR, to your human resources, because you need to look at it. And this is part of a lot of the work I'm doing here in Singapore, is looking at insurance companies, looking at uh, companies where we have conversations with the human resources to look at how we can optimize the workplace for women going through the menopause. And this applies to men as well. It applies to mental health and well-being, looking at your pregnancy and uh, breastfeeding policies. So 
the um, this is from the British Menopause Society and the Women's Health Concern, where you can actually use these links and resources uh, and have a little read through and share it with your teams as well. Right, some take home messages, because I know we're coming up to time. Remember, what works for your friend may not work for you. And I know we like to sit and chat about what each and everyone is taking, what's, what everyone's on. But remember, this is very individual. And don't just take something because somebody else is. It must be holistic and individual and your quality of life is key. I want to talk about health screening. It's not something we do enough in, in Sri Lanka. And I want people to use this opportunity. If you have, say, a work insurance, medical insurance, speak to that insurance provider. Do they cover a health screen for you? Does your work cover a health screen for you? Or can you go and get it done? And think about the aspects of lifestyle medicine and what actually needs to change there. So it's an opportune moment to look at your overall health. Hormone therapy is safe, especially when used at the right time in the right way. And please get help. I've specifically put a link there for partners. So feel free to use this. And when I have a new patient for a menopause consult, I send an email with the resources. And this is one of the links I use. Because sometimes it's hard to sit and have a conversation with your partner. It's if it comes from a third party or they're, they're listening to a video, watching a video, listening to someone speak, reading something, it can then open up that conversation. Here are some resources. I wanted to focus a lot on the menopause courses because I know it's hard to find somewhere to actually go and learn more. Um, I've been lucky enough to have access to resources. But these are a couple of options for the clinicians. And actually, the confidence in the menopause course through Newson Health um, can be done by non-clinicians as well. Okay, Looking at the Menopause Society, British Menopause Society, Australasian Menopause Society, the North American. Um, and uh, I've got the Sri Lankan Society of Lifestyle Medicine in there because I'm so proud of all the work everyone's doing, especially from an education point of view getting um, the right information out. Uh, there's a lot of hard work that goes in. So special congratulations to the team who are doing it. Um, I've also got some of my personal go-to podcasts. Okay, So looking at it from a menopause point of view, um, how to burn fat. I know that's a question that came up. Remember, it's finding what works for you. But key things when it comes to weight management is getting that high protein and fiber in and getting that strength training in and being consistent, doing what is consistent for you. Uh, looking at it from a Mindy Peltz point of view, um, looking at how nutrition plays a part uh, and also Peter Atia, a conversation with, uh, with Joanne Manson, which I think you'll enjoy as well. This is our clinic, uh, Osla. We are um, international doctors and we're based in Singapore. We've got two clinics, one at the uh, Raffles Hotel at the Arcade, just behind the hotel. So I'm actually back in the clinic right now. Uh, and one in Star Vista, so slightly on the west, in the West. And we do a lot of work with Medicine 3.0. So we've, we are all family physicians, but we've set ourselves up to really look at, look at the next step when it comes to prevention and holistic health and well-being. That's me done. Any questions? Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Tasha. That was just such an amazing talk. Um, it really makes you think, think about the importance um, and not just, you know, when you're really struggling with that particular thing, but actually thinking of it beforehand, because it takes us a long time to get to this, to that point. And a lot of people expect a quick fix, but you can't reverse something that has taken years to kind of build up. Right. So now we're going to open up. I are you on mute, Tasha? Uh, no, I'm on. Right. Can you hear me? Right. Yeah. yeah, I can hear you now. All right. So we're now going to open up um, for any questions that anyone has. Please raise your hand or just unmute yourself and you can ask the question. Um, hi, Tasha. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, I just have a question. So some of us are on. Um, the marina coil already for um, uh, um, contraception or from yeah for contraception. Yeah. So yeah. how do you know if you're you know going into the are you in, are you in peri perimenopause if you don't have any symptoms? Yeah, 
And like, do you do a blood test? Is there any particular um, time or age or when you would recommend? Or so do you just carry on if you're fine? That's a great question. A quarter of women will not have symptoms, in which case you keep optimizing your lifestyle measures and you bet on. As I said, the marina coil is a great, great resource uh, and option to have because what it does is it just calms those hormones down, right? It stops a lot of this up and down. If you still have symptoms through it, then you can always add some estrogen to it if needed. You mentioned a blood test. Now, technically, most women don't need a blood test to check their hormones. And I know that's something even now I'll have lots of women saying, oh, I need to know what my hormones are. I said, well, mm -hmm. why do you need to know what your hormones are? Clinically, here's where you're at. Here's what we need to do. It doesn't change our management plan. However, an instance where we do look at hormone testing is if someone has the marina coil. Now, the marina mm -hmm. coil is licensed for contraception. Now, recently, we increased it to eight years. But if you oh, use it okay. as part of hormone therapy, it's licensed yeah. for four to five years. Right. Also, if you get a marina coil in at the age of 45, so I put them in the clinic. This is not something you need to see a gynecologist for, um, but a lot of, lot of GPs do, is um, if you put it in at 45 and you don't use it, you're only using it from a contraception point of view, it can stay until you're 55 and then be removed. That's where the licensing is. You can okay. blood test, yeah. You can do a blood test to check your FSH to confirm menopause before taking it out. Or at any point, if say average age 47, 49, 51, you think, you know what, I feel absolutely fine. I don't think I need the marina anymore. That's when we can do a blood test to check your FSH. But otherwise, generally speaking, there's no real need to um, being on the marina call. If you're under the age of 40 and having symptoms, whether you're on the marina or not, that's when I would be checking other tests as well. So you're ruling out organic causes. You're looking at it from uh, and uh, estradiol, progesterone, testosterone uh, point of view and your FSH and LH. But that's some key nuggets there for the marina coil. And, and I heard you go, ah, so that changed last year, actually. So the licensing for contraception for the marina is now eight years. Eight. Oh, OK, because I was told five the last yeah. time I had mine. Yeah. And that's you great. Check, Thank you. Checked once. Yeah, it's, yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Um. Hi, Tasha. Um. I'm Lumbini. Can I just ask? Um. What kinds of HRT exist? Like. Uh. Is there like cyclical and continuous combined? And what's the difference? Certainly. Great question. So, if somebody has a regular period or still having a bleed, generally speaking, every month or so, we can use what's called cyclical hormone therapy, which is where you are on estrogen throughout your cycle and you're on the progesterone for the last two weeks. So we create a new 28-day cycle for you. So day one to 28, you're on the estrogen component. Day 15 to 28 or 26, you're on the progesterone component. What that means is that you will then have a bleed. So especially younger women who are still having a bleed, we don't want to just stop your period early unless it's something like the marina coil where a natural response could be that you lose your period. Continuous works particularly well when somebody's period is getting less and less, a bit more erratic, maybe it's every three months. So it just helps to steady state those hormones because you're coming into that sort of menopause time. And that is where you're on estrogen and progesterone continuously. So that can be done either in the form of a combination of the femistin, for example. So in Sri Lanka, I know we've got uh, femistin. Femistin comes as uh, femistin 110, 210, which is the cyclical. And then the continuous is the femistin conti, which is usually one in five. So you've got the one milligram of the, uh, of the estrogen component, and then the rest is the progesterone. Uh, so the continuous combined won't result in a period, would it? In the first three to six months, you could have a bleed. So when you're on, even on sort of contraception, hormone therapy, it's not a natural period that you end up having. It's actually a more of a breakthrough bleed. So when the lining of the womb thickens enough, it just sheds. And that can be regular, it can be irregular. When you go on to the continuous preparation, usually in the first three to six months, the bleeding pattern can be a little erratic. After that, in most women, you may 
just not have any more bleeding or every so often you may have a bleed. And it, it would be normal uh, unless it's excessive, in yes. which case you have to investigate, right? Yes, so even with the investigating part, in the first three to six months of starting hormone therapy or changing hormone therapy, if there is a bleed, I wouldn't jump the gun with investigating, getting pelvic scans, et cetera, hysteroscopies, because it's giving the body time to adjust and adapt when it comes to the hormone levels in the body. So that would be the first three to six months? Yes, it? first three to six okay. months, yes, yeah, of starting. Okay, thank you so much. Because the first three to six months anyway is what we call a therapeutic trial. So if it works for somebody, great, you continue. If it doesn't, you stop. Within a day or two, your hormones are back to back to your baseline. Thank you. Pleasure. Hello. Hello. Hi, Tasha. Thank you for that talk. My pleasure. Tasha, my I just wanted to ask you of things that um, you know, what I see in the clinic and that I struggle with. And, um, you know, I, I know I know the theory, but I, I was going to ask you for your experience. Um, these are the biggest issues I have. Everyone walks in and says, I'm perimenopausal. I want a hormone test, you know. Mm -hmm. And I say, and they, I don't know whether it's in fashion now, but everyone wants to check their inverted commas hormones, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I just say, oh, which hormones? When I jolly well know what hormones they want, you know. Because, you know, there are so many of them, but they always say, you know, I want to test my hormones. So I said, you know, you're still getting periods. It's pointless checking your hormones. And then, you know, they try to strong arm you into it. Um, then the next problem I have is, uh, is that correct? I mean, what is the point in checking their hormones? They're going to be normal and you have to check them on the certain days. And then I make it sound very complicated and say you need day one and day 21. And then they kind of veer off it. Now, the second problem I have is uh, that I can't find a solution to is tiredness. You know, they come and complain of tiredness. Now, apart from, and they also want quick fixes, you know. So the neighbor's taken magnesium, the other person's taken that, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah. what I now tend to say is, you know, there are all these things. It's trial and error. Just try a concoction that works for you as long as it's not dangerous. And I look at generally they bring their little bottle or a little leaflet. Mm -hmm. And as long as there aren't, you know, high levels of anything, I say try it for a couple of months, see if it works. But apart from that, for tiredness, for not having the same amount of energy. Um, is there anything, absolutely anything that you find that works better than the other? The only thing I find is vaginal dryness, estrogen cream. Now that they're very happy with because it works. Yeah. Absolutely. Other than that, I'm quite ineffective because I don't think they stick to my, you know, sleep well, eat well, diet well. They want to lose weight fast. Um Everyone seems to be on Ozempic now. I didn't even know it was licensed here, but everyone is go. You know, they fly overseas and come back with their Ozempic. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, they have their tiredness. So my problems are tiredness, hormone tests, and um, quick weight loss. Yeah. That is there anything, even slightly scientific, that can make me look a little effective? I think you are more than effective. You're not giving yourself enough credit. It's also what's uh, unfortunately in social media is everyone wants a quick fix, which is why I started with, unfortunately, there is no quick fix. When no. it comes to hormone testing, it's just from a science point of view, if you are in the perimenopause, especially over the age of 40, there is technically no indication to just do mm. hormone tests. Now, Correct. if somebody is insisting on it, then you can go ahead and do it and just say, yeah, your hormones are what they are right? Yeah. The main things I would look at is really looking at it from an estrogen point of view, uh, FSH mm -hmm. point of view, and a total testosterone point of view, right? Okay. Also looking at if you're going to do a blood test, especially if it's associated with tiredness, ruling out other causes. So yes. look at that yeah. type, right? looking at their B12, folic acid. We do, yeah. Yeah. Those we, we do, do routinely. Yeah. Yeah. The, so this is where sometimes it's just saying, okay, you want that test, I can do it. But here's my advice. I'm happy to still do it. If that's something you really want, it doesn't change my management plan. 
And I think that's where I have a lot of women who go, ah, okay. So it's not going to change anything. Therefore, do I want to spend the money and do it if it's not going to change Dr. Tasha's plan? So I think this is where you have to just have that conversation and manage expectations early. I still have women who want it, in which case they do. And then I look at it, I compare numbers and I will go through it with them. But the main thing is to do a test is if it's going to change your management. Right? But have you found anything you can tweak by doing any particular test other than your iron levels and your TSH and you know things like that? Do you Have you found anything like any micronutrients, anything that works? So routinely, I wouldn't, but mm. really looking at, so if you look at it from a heart health point of view, and we're doing homocysteine and ApoB, LP little a as a one-off, uh, right. HSPRP, then right. you can look at with the homocysteine, if it's uh, high, yeah. you're optimizing the B12 and folic acid, right? Right, because and of course, there are vitamin D. D. Yes, and the vitamin D. Yeah. Yes. Looking at magnesium actually plays a huge part. So if we look at it supplements wise, for me, it's nutrition first, right? Supplements mm -hmm. are always an add-on. But okay. if you look at it from a supplement point of view, you're looking at your magnesium, you're looking at mm -hmm. vitamin D and calcium, you're looking at a B complex, because it's not mm -hmm. just about having a normal B12 level, it's optimizing that. Right? Correct. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And then looking at it from a, uh, from a, a vitamin C and zinc point of view. Uh, especially from an immune immune system viewpoint. Um, right. And do the, you find the magnesium helps with sleep at all? Yes, it does. Yeah. And yeah. also, okay. if you are, right. yeah. And the magnesium, you can take uh, the, the biglycinate or a combination magnesium. It's just finding the right one for you. And you take it right. sort of 20 minutes to 30 minutes before bedtime. Um, Ashia, if I yeah. may jump in, of sorry, course. there is a question in the chat. What yes. magnesium yes. specifically, since we're on the topic of magnesium? Yes, so it's the magnesium by glycinate or a combination magnesium. So a citrate with oxide mix. We have a magnesium oxide that's cheaply available on the market that helps with sleep, muscle yeah. cramps type thing. I don't know whether it's a placebo effect or patients seem to like it. Yeah, but it's, it's finding, and again, looking at it nutritionally as well, but with the tiredness... If you yes. can get the strength work in with the protein and the fiber, the more muscle mass you end up having. And as I said, nobody is going to look like a bodybuilder because I know that's a real concern. Um, mm. But it's really looking at that's where you can reverse that fatigue because the more muscle right. mass you have, the stronger you are, your glucose control gets better, your risk of diabetes, heart disease, cancers all come down. Right. If you're tired yeah. enough in the evening, you take your magnesium, you get the muscle recovery and you're getting enough quality sleep. So that's your REM sleep to yeah. be able to recover so you feel better in the morning. Got it. Okay. The last so that's part this is something. Yeah. The last part you mentioned is the Ozempic. And with the, you know, oh, SGLT2s have a huge part to play. And yeah. I am an advocate for it for the right person. The issue is a right. lot of people are getting it and using it the wrong way. And one hmm. of the biggest factors with weight loss is you're losing muscle mass. And one of the effects of that- You put on fat loss, later. And you put on fat later. As so soon as they stop it. Yeah. Is not about just for weight loss. You have to get the lifestyle measures in. You have to get that strength training in first before you can then go on a Zempic to then lose weight. You've got to do it all in combination. Got it. And anything for this, I feel tired for the first two weeks of my cycle. That's that drop in drop in estrogen, and that's where that the nutrition piece, the sleep piece, and the strength training. There's no magic medicine. No magic fix, right? Yeah. All Tasha, right, Tasha. Sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Tasha. Do we have any other? We I think we can take maybe we, one more question out of Tasha's time. If <laughs> that's <we're>... all right. <laughs> I was just looking at the list of questions that came earlier. So there was yeah. one about uh, will total abdominal hysterectomy without an oophorectomy, so that's where the womb is removed, but the, the ovaries are kept in place, cause early menopause if surgery is done for a lady less than 35. It depends on how much function you have left in the ovaries and how much it can still continue to work. Um, it will still continue to work. We just don't know how long. So it's keeping an eye on those symptoms, but you don't have to go on hormone therapy immediately. However, if both the womb and the ovaries were removed, 
the indication is straight on to some estrogen. Great. Uh, there is also another question. How does lifestyle um, yeah, medicine implicate common menopausal symptoms um, and need, you know, repl uh, replace the need for HRT? Uh, yes. yes. So absolutely. Right. As I said, hormone therapy is the sprinkle, the add on that comes once you have optimized your base, your solid base when it comes to your lifestyle measures as a, a quarter of women don't even have any symptoms, right? So it doesn't mean you have to go on hormone therapy. Now, where the research is working on at the moment is the benefits we don't see. So reducing heart risk, reducing the risk of osteoporosis, Alzheimer's, dementia, um, uh, diabetes, and other chronic conditions. That's what we are now moving into, and it will become a longevity therapy. But for now, we use it to manage symptoms. Thanks, Tasha. Just... Do we have time for one more very general question? Um, and this was also in the questionnaire. And um, is there something we uh, something women must do pre-menopause before menopause sets in in terms of lifestyle medicine or basically just go along with whatever it is? <laughs> I know you covered this, but I think- Let me you summarize it. Absolutely. So in the pre-menopause, it's about, so looking at it in your 30s, right? How do you optimize each part of your lifestyle pillars? Because you can't do everything all at the same time. Please don't think you can, because if you try to, you'll get so frustrated, you'll end up doing nothing. This is why these six-week, 12-week fat diets of ketos and low carbs and low this and low that's and avoiding this and avoiding that just doesn't work. And I can see Raida shaking her head as a registered dietitian and a doctor to, to know that it's looking at what is sustainable. So keep it simple. Focus on your protein and your fiber. Our Sri Lankan food and what we have available is the best in the world. I know we talk about the Mediterranean diet, but I'm sorry, our Sri Lankan food surpasses it. The issue we have is the amount of rice we have, right? If you're a farmer, it's different, right? You can have it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but most of us are not. We have, you know, jobs where we're more sedentary. And this is where you really need to focus on that nutrition piece. And then you build it with the exercise. Start with the walking, look at that strength and conditioning. Do it as a group, get together as a, a, a cohort of people, do it as part of your work um, and you build it up. And then this is what you do forever, right? Um, whether you are 30, whether you are 70 and it's the first time you're picking up a weight, this is what you need to do. And that's how you make it your norm so that when you then start to get into your late 30s, 40s, 50s, you're already doing what you need to do. So anything extra is simply extra. You don't have to change that mindset all over again. Thank you so much, Tasha. I think that summarized everything really, really well. Um, and the importance of the pillars of lifestyle medicine and kind of incorporating it, not just when the problem comes, but before the problem. So preventive, like you said. Um, I think the other questions we saw in the questionnaire you addressed in your talk as well. So I don't think we need to go into that. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. I've up the resources here while you were speaking. I just, uh, Samandika and I both typed it up. So anyone can just click on the link or take a screenshot as well. Um, and the recording will be shared on the Sri Lanka Society of Lifestyle Medicine YouTube channel for those who couldn't be here. And again, thank you very much for taking the time. All well, thanks to <laughs> Dr. Tashia for such a, an insightful talk. Thank My you so pleasure. much. Thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for being here. Thank you.